Can y'all hear me? Yeah. All right. Can we turn to Titus chapter 3? Titus chapter 3. It's great to be with you this morning. Can we commit our time to the Lord? Father God, we just thank you. Thank you for what your, your son has done. Thank you for what you've done in our lives, in our families' lives, in our children's lives. And Father, use this time as you see fit. Equip your people, strengthen your people, grow your people. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, amen. Okay. Thank you. So by way of review, last week, we endeavored in the last part of Paul's doctrinal section entitled Handling False Teachers in Titus 3, verses 9 through 11. Paul described the false teachers one last time. He even gave uh, prescriptions, right, for how to handle them. Prescribing a grace-based three-strike rule, if I could put it that way. Uh, those who were against the teaching of the apostles, those who caused division in the church, uh, created dissenting groups, would first be silence. That was strike one. If they regarded that, corre uh, that correction, then strike two was in order. And it was to, strike two was to reprove them severely. And Paul said this is, the purpose in that is bringing them back in line with sound doctrine to make them sound in the faith. It is very important to understand that the, the disciplinary actions are implemented for wayward believers, not unbelievers. And if the, if the two strikes, the first two strikes, strikes were disregarded, Paul says leaders have the God-given right to reject a factious man, or even eject a factious person. This is when and only when the church has the right to excommunicate this person from fellowship. And we read or we learned in prior lessons that the, the final, the purpose of this final method of discipline is to bring shame. If that person refuses church discipline because a lack of obedience and repentance, then perhaps discipline from the Lord is in order. This is where we left off uh, last Sunday before I was so rudely interrupted by the clock. And uh, I, I honestly contemplated holding you guys hostage until I finished my, my last point, but I just remembered how crabby my wife gets when she gets hungry, so. I uh, notice she's not here, but uh, uh, so I relented. Uh, but, but just to pick up where we left off, look with me very quickly at Titus 3.11. Titus 3.11. According to Paul, after this third offense, it would be safe to assume that this factious person was never truly saved in the first place. Whoops, that's not what it says, right? It doesn't say that. It says that you should assume, it's safely to assume that this person is perverted, is sinning, and self-condemned, condemned. knowing that. Paul said you should know that. In other words, it's evident from his blatant disregard for discipline and unrepentant heart that such a man is perverted and sinning, is sinning. We could say living in sin and being self-condemned. In other words, he chose that route for himself. What is this man perverted in exactly? I think the context would confirm that his doctrine, his, his doctrine was perverted. His teaching was perverted. Paul had very strong words about this back in 
in Titus, Titus 1.10. They were rebellious men. See that? They were, they were a group already forming and dissenting. They were empty talkers and deceivers, teaching things they should not teach. They were liars. Chapter 1, verse 12. Paying attention to myths, and they turned away from truth. 1, 14, verse 14. And they were defiled, notice here, both in their mind and conscience. Chapter 1, verse 15. They were so perverted in their doctrine, this naturally led to their uh, detestable behavior. Chapter 1, verse 16. It starts with the doctrine. And because this was so, look back at verse 11 again. Know then that they are self-condemned. Some will say, well, there it is. The false teachers were condemned, therefore unbelievers. Well, look again. They were self-condemned. God disciplines his own. He does not condemn his own. This person is self-condemned, evidenced by his defiant and unrepentant uh, posture. By the way, this word self-condemned, it's, it's another uh, hapax legomena, meaning Paul only used that word once in the New Testament, and it's here and here only. Aside from discipline, the only judgment on the horizon for believers is at the Bema Seat judgment of Christ, as you see from the slide above. This judgment is not to determine our salvation that's already been resolved at the point of faith in Yeshua. Amen? If you're not familiar with this doctrine, I, I encourage you to study that up. It's a, a, a very, it's a blessing. It's a benefit to know that doctrine. Uh, that doctrine has been taught from this pulpit before, but I'm not going into much detail here, but this doctrine is for believers only. And in that judgment, believers will be judged, believers will be assessed, and evaluated on how we believers lived our Christian lives while here on earth. Get this, whether good or bad. And based on that conclusion, that will determine on whether or not we are given by Christ, from Christ, rewards. So as a wayward believer, this factious person will condemn himself in that judgment, making himself a candidate for loss of rewards, or worse, no, no rewards at all. However, his entrance into heaven is secured. And it's very interesting that Paul would go through great lengths to cause an awareness of false teachers within the church and even warn them, the false teachers, of these consequences. Warn the false teachers of, you know, who would find themselves in a local body of believers and so how would this look like in a, modern, in a modern context, in our context, for example? So a few years back, I was nominated as an elder in this congregation, and it's truly an honor and privilege to, uh, to serve this church. And as an elder, I have the privilege to, of conducting uh, membership interviews with awesome people and their families who are applying for membership to this church. And when you consider church membership here at SOBC, there's a, we have an application for you to fill out. And there's an interview process. And my favorite question is, can you describe your salvation experience? It, it, and that's actually on the application, when, where, and how you became saved. That's obviously important. Um, and also important that you are able to articulate your, your salvation experience. There are other questions in that application. One of them 
is an inquiry up, up on the screen that's particularly relevant to this lesson. And it reads like this. I, that's the applicant, have read, understood, and agree with the church philosophy and statements of faith. I have also read the position statements and fully agree with, with agree with all except, and there's a line there, there's a space provided to give you, to, you know, um, give your areas of disagreement. And it goes on to say, I understand that while I do not have to agree with them, these are the church's positions about several issues, and the teaching of the church will be consistent with these positions. So this statement here is sort of a strategic way that how SOBC will put into application what we're seeing here in Titus, the instructions that Paul gives to Titus here. As much as we would love to get to know you and your family and enjoy your fellowship, um, we also want to know where you're coming from theologically. Uh, I think it's fair. I think it's reasonable given the philosophical climate today, right? And when I go over this question with, with members or potential members, I emphasize that it's okay. It's okay that you hold differing views on SOBC, on issues regarding the Bible and, and doctrine and theology. That's, that's completely fine. You, you can go your way while we go the way of Jesus. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm playing, I'm playing. But in the interview I say, uh, that's fine if you hold a, an opposing view, but all we ask as a church is that, in return, is that you you don't propagate or, or uh, teach your conflicting or contradictory beliefs uh, unbeknownst to the teaching elders of the church. This would be, by definition, define you as a factious person. Teaching things that would seek to create dissension in the church, division in the local body, in this local body of believers, um, if you need clarification on anything pertaining to the Bible and doctrine, just go to Andy. No, I'm kidding. Uh, there's plenty of people that could help you out, um, myself included. We're happy to, to we're happy to discuss that with you. But to note also, by applying for membership, you are agreeing to maintain unity. Unity in this fellowship. Not only that, as a member, you're also placing yourself under the divine protection and spiritual care of Christ's church and his leadership. And we will do everything in our power to provide that for you and your family. This would include sound doctrine, um, taught to you and your children and your grandchildren if you have them. And this would also include correction and discipline according to what Scripture says and is appropriate, should there be a need, of course. And why does SLBC do this? We're commanded to. In order that we may protect the unity, the spiritual uh, care of, the, of this local flock, to defend and teach sound doctrine and exhort righteous living. It's no different than what Paul is doing here with Titus and Timothy. This completes the doctrinal section of, of Titus, chapter 2 and verse 1 through chapter 3 and verse 11, where Paul addresses the doctrinal issues with Titus to relay to the churches at Crete. And this now moves us into the conclusion. And the church said, praise the Lord, amen. <laughs> this is the benediction section of the letter, specifically chapters three, verses 12 through 15. And although it's bittersweet to, 
to be here in this final section, I was actually terrified of the prospect. Uh, one reason is because at first glance, this, this section here, very small, it seems, it really doesn't appeal to the reader at first, right? I mean, it mentions a few missionary colleagues of his, of Paul's, makes a few last requests to Titus regarding the local body in there in Crete, or I should say local bodies. And then he signs off. And, you know, many times as Bible readers and Bible students, I, and I know I'm guilty of this, we tend to read right past these final sections. And I found that when, when I became patient with the text, things just started opening up. What is, what is this, four sentences? Let's read Titus 3, 12 through 15. When I send, Ar I, that's Paul, when I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, that he's speaking to Titus. For I, Paul, have decided to spend the winter there, diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Our people must learn, must also learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs, so that they will not be unfruitful. And who are, all who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. And so the more and more I read and reread these final four sentences, I found myself very fascinated with them. Number one, be, well, they're inspired, of course, inspired of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 confirms that. But that's on like a um, vertical. It's a vertical plane. It's fascinating because it's on a vertical plane. That's a wonderful, it's wonderful truth coming from God. But it's also coming from a, from a horizontal plane. These are words coming from a mere man, like you and I, the Apostle Paul. One who had desires, concerns, aspirations, goals, just like us. He had a distinct personality. Uh, I like to think that he had a soft side, a very tender side. Uh, from his letters, he sure did have a strong side and a firm side. He also had a pass, right? He had a checkered pass at that. Yet he was forgiven by God. He called himself a slave to God. And he has an incredible, incredible testimony. He wasn't perfect, although he was sold out to God. And he still struggled, right? He still struggled with temptation, with the flesh, with sin. Read Romans. Romans 7, 14 through 25 sometime. He struggled just like us. We went over the, the life of Paul in the earlier uh, lessons of this lesson series when we asked the question, who wrote the book? And aside from Christ, he was the, the greatest missionary and contributor to the Bible the world has ever seen. And if you look carefully at the text in Titus, we're given, we're given something very special here. We get a glimpse into Paul's world, Paul's mind, and his perspective on ministry. Just a brief one. This is who, God, this is who Christ chose for himself to dispense his message of grace to the world. And so that's why I've entitled this message Ministry from Paul's perspective. Look at the text again. If you think about it, it's very personal. It's very private correspondence. We would equate this to like a private email. Yeah, if I could use the modern terminology. These are ministry plans. Ministry plans coming from the mind of Paul himself meant only for the eyes of a trusted believer, brother in Christ, Titus. And why would God include this kind of material 
in, in, this, in this letter. Four sentences. I think it holds, you know, aside from its personal and private characteristic or characteristics, uh, this letter contains very practical elements that leaders of the church, in the church, in general, can, can really learn from. That said, let me, let me share five observations with you, which I believe are naturally revealed in these last sentences of Titus. Five observ- observations to help us better understand the work of ministry from Paul's perspective. The first observation is the blessings of orderly ministry. The blessings of orderly ministry. Look at verse, or chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 again. When I, that's Paul, send Artemis to Tychicus or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis. For I have decided to spend the winter there, diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. If I could just use this illustration as you read this, Paul is like a construction manager here. He's managing, he's instructing, he's delegating, giving directives to his crew, his construction team, in an orderly manner on where they need to be and what they need to do on a very important project, perhaps. If you're into music, Paul is like a orchestra conductor here where he's directing musicians on their craft and their discipline. Carry out this chord and this note and now to the chorus. Paul is a conductor. If you're into business, Paul sounds like a general manager here making schedules making sure his employees are there on time and clocked in, doing what they're hired to do. And for all intents and and purposes, Paul is running a well-oiled machine here. And, you know, he mentions other people here, and it would be safe to imply that these men too, like Paul, have given up. Has, ha, they have sacrificed much to do the work of ministry, travel the world, lodge here for a season, then lodge there for a season, all under the direction of this man, Paul. We see here Paul instructing Titus. We see Paul instructing a gentle, these gentlemen here, Artemis and Tychicus. And likely, he's probably instructing Zenos and Apollos there. Paul mentions Artemis. The Bible only mentions him here. I couldn't find much on this person. Only that Artemis is a Greek name, and it means a male follower of the Greek goddess, goddess Artemis. So Artemis was a Gentile, and likely he had a history in paganism, but not after meeting Paul. Amen? Now Artemis has a testimony too. We know a uh, a lot more of Tychicus from Scripture. We read a lot about him in the book of Acts and throughout some of Paul's other letters, including this one. Tychicus, also a Greek name, he shows up on the scene in Acts 20, verse 4, along with a larger group of of missionaries, colleagues of Paul. Tychicus, from scripture, he came from the region of Asia Minor, and he was described by by Paul like this. In Ephesians 6, 21, he said, as the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, he will make Titus, he will make everything known to you. So from that verse and 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul said it's, uh, and from that verse, 1 Corinthians and 4, 7, it seems Titus was very, he was well informed of Paul's teaching. He knew the word. 
And he was critical to Paul's uh, work of ministry. He was a person that brought um, maybe a courier of sorts. He was the person that brought critical church information from church to church. We see other characters uh, and other men of God, right? Willing, to, willing and availing themselves under the delegation and the direction of Paul there. This guy named Zenos, also a Greek name, like Artemis, very little about him in scripture, except this verse. Zenos also is a Greek name. It's a short name for Xenodos, which means gift of Zeus. And I can't prove this next item, but tradition has it that Zenos was one of the 70 disciples sent out by Jesus in Galilee. That was in Luke, Luke chapter 10. I, I, I think there's only one way to confirm that, however. You'll have to ask Zenos when you get to heaven. Also from this text, we know that Zenos is a lawyer. There's also Apollos. We know a lot about Apollos. He's given a cameo uh, in Acts chapter 18 through 19. We know from Acts 18.24 that Apollos was a Jew, a Hebrew from Alexandria. It says, it says here in Acts 18.24, Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, and get this, an eloquent man came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. How would you like to have a person mighty in the scriptures on your missionary team? Mighty in scripture. Do you think Paul was blessed by having Apollos and Titus on his team? I bet he was. So all these men, let's not forget the unnumbered and unnamed men, and perhaps women too, there with Paul at that time. Paul said, all who are with me, right? Titus 3.15. With Paul instructing and scheduling and delegating the work of ministry to these men who are obviously availing themselves under the apostolic ministry of Paul, we get a sense that ministry to Paul was very structured and very orderly, something that is very critical to any church. Let's not forget, Titus was given uh, this command as well. In Titus 1.5, he was told by Paul so that he would set in order what remains. Structure and order brings efficiency and organization. It has the potential to streamline processes and workflows, including the work of ministry, the blessings of an orderly ministry. What else do we see? Another observation is the blessings of a shared ministry, the blessings of a shared ministry. So like a conductor, like a construction manager, he's responsible for moving you know, his team from location to location, delegating the work. You know, you go evangelize here, you do mission works, work there. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot. A lot of physical energy, emotional energy, spiritual energy. It also takes total dependency on the Holy Spirit and his resources. And equally as important, it takes the help of others. If you look carefully there at verse 12 and 13, he is sending in relief. He's sending in relief for Titus. As we said earlier, Titus was left in Crete and given the task of finishing up what Paul and Titus started. Setting in order, Titus 1.5, what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Every city? You mean there's more than one city, Paul? More than one church? And Paul's like, yes, Titus. Also, you must lead a bunch of rascal people who are liars, who are cheaters, 
who are gluttons, who are beasts. And oh yeah, there's some false teachers there in the churches too that are causing a ruckus, that need discipline. Do you think you can handle that, Titus? You can just see the blood drain from Titus's face, yeah? Would you stay? If the Apostle Paul left you at Crete, Titus stayed. And this was no small order. Question, do you think Titus needed someone to relieve him? I think so. Someone to share the load of ministry? Do you think Titus had appreciated that? Some relief? I wouldn't doubt it for one bit. This just shows the wisdom of Paul. And how Paul was very mindful that his people in leadership positions should not be just left alone and abandoned to figure out ministry for themselves on their own, lest they become fatigued or worse, burnout. Ministry leaders need assistance. Ministry leaders need relief. There is much benefit to to a shared ministry. There's blessings in it. From the text, if you look at the text again, we're not certain who, as to who relieved Titus. We can assume that Paul never finalized his decision. He said, when, not if, when I send Artemis and Tychicus. We can safely assume that Titus bore a heavy load, no doubt, and Paul was mindful of that. I remember when I, w- I was fresh out of Bible college, and I began to volunteer here at SOBC, I started off helping out with Bruce in the directing music, playing guitar, leading worship. And I, I, I knew he was relieved. <laughs> and he was appreciative, appreciative of my volunteering. He expressed it many times, his thankfulness, and every so often his wife, Lynn, would say, Bruce is very thankful for you filling in. I had the honor of being the, uh, to direct the children's ministry at one point in this church. Although the children's ministry was much smaller back then. Um, But even so, I I do remember that it was always uh, a blessed challenge (laughs) to find and enlist Volunteers for teachers in the children's ministry. I mean, there were always your faithful, regular volunteers. Amen for those. Don't get me wrong. And you know who you are. Very thankful for them. And so I know when, when, when Casey is up here, our current children's director, when she comes and stands at this podium asking for assistance, She's asking that you share the load with her, the burden of ministry. I can totally totally relate to her, totally. And to this day, there is still a continual need in the children's ministry for volunteers, teachers, helpers. The blessings of a shared ministry. I also remember when... uh, As a children's director, Andy asked me to put together a VBS, something that wasn't done in years at this church since the last pastor had left and Andy took over. Uh, He looked me straight in the eyes and he said, so you think you can handle that? I said, yes. (laughs) Uh, And guess what? God sent Artemis. And he sent me Tychicus to bear the load of of VBS. And we had a huge turnout. In fact, we had more volunteers than children. It was, and we had a blast. We had so much fun. And VBS continues to this day. Amen. And when God sends those people who are willing and who are available, who are teachable, 
Man, you would not believe the amount of weight that's lifted off the leader's shoulders. I am reminded of what Proverbs 11 and verse 25. I love how the NIV states this. It says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. The NASB says the latter part, the NASB says it like this, and he who waters will himself be watered. Ministry, that's a win-win scenario. This is exactly as Paul's point here in 1 Corinthians 16, 15 through 17. He says, now I urge you, brethren, and then he goes and reminds them, you know the household of Stephanus, and they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the, to the saints, that you, that's the brethren in the church, that you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortune. Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have supplied what was lacking on your part, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. I think Paul knew very well this concept of refreshing others and watering others in the body of Christ, didn't he? This was Paul's perspective the idea of shared ministry. I'm also reminded of 1 Corinthians, just moving along down the, the passage. Paul said this of his fellow ministry leaders, I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Notice here, now he who plants and he who waters are one. Did Paul just say we should share the work of ministry? I think so. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Ah, so there's not only a blessing of shared ministry when ministry is executed together, there, there are rewards. Rewards come with that. Very interesting. To who exactly are rewards given? Did you catch it? Each one will receive his own reward. So as a team member, in the work of ministry, God will reward us individually for your team efforts. Ministry is a, t is, a, is a shared and team-oriented endeavor, and God is the rewarder. Paul goes on in verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. See the blessing of shared ministry? Paul is with the mindset of preserving and restoring the worker's sanity. He instructs and delegates either Artemis or Tychicus, to relieve Titus. We can also assume these men were trustworthy, obviously qualified for the position of overseeing the, the churches there in Crete. The, the task required stamina and experience. Amen? Let's continue. 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid the foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Do you see Paul's mindset here? He trusts Artemis and Tychicus. They're trustworthy men, ready and willing to participate in a shared ministry and to relieve, Paul, uh, relieve Titus. By the way, before we move on, these verses here I just showed. 
Would you agree with me that these verses that, that Paul just spoke of here is talking about the work of ministry, the labor that's put in in ministry, and what ministry should look like amongst believers? The idea of shared ministry. Would you agree with me on that? Because I want you to notice something there. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, we read it. Or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 through 11. This is the ver these are the verses we just read. Oh, from here to here. These verses precede. They come before the verse that unfolds the doctrine of the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. I spoke about that earlier. Two major pa uh, passages in, the, in this doctrine is here, and then in 2 Corinthians 5, chapters 9 through 10. And, th and in this judgment, as I said before, believers will be evaluated. And I want you to notice this. The doctrine of the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ stands shoulder to shoulder. Maybe I should say cheek to cheek with Paul's explanation of how ministry is expected to look like. I think this is very significant because when you hear uh, the, the doctrine of the Bema Seat explained, especially from uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, it's typically from the standpoint of how we live our lives. That's true, that's very true. But notice how close in proximity and how closely related it is to the work and labor of ministry. Paul keeps mentioning these, the, you know, the works of ministry, the laboring, the watering, and he, and he talks about workers on a, on a building project and building upon a foundation upon Christ Jesus. And then you read the following. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, notice how Paul uh, elaborates what these elements represent, each man's work. That's the work of shared ministry. Each man's work will become evident for the day, that would be the the judgment day, will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Beloved, beloved, like your decision to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your decision to commit to the work and labor of shared ministry, you will not regret. Paul says there are rewards at the end of, at, at the end of this road. And notice, he's, notice I said that it's, it's your decision you can choose to participate in the work of ministry or not. But Paul said, remember what he said back in 1 Corinthians 16? Now I urge you, brethren. He didn't say, I command you. He said, I entreat you. I encourage you. You think Paul is saying, you want, do you want to be rewarded by Christ himself or not? I urge you, brethren, I exhort you, I strongly encourage you. However, it's your choice. If I could use this modern analogy and verbiage, you're sitting on a winning lottery ticket. And don't go around saying that Gabe promotes the lottery. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. Paul is urging us to get in the game. Notice again, 1 Corinthians 3, 8. 
Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. This was Paul's perspective, the blessing of shared ministry. And I actually have a picture of Pastor Andy at the Bema seat. Did you know that? And I predict that this is exactly how Pastor Andy will look at the Bema seat with a big old grin. Amen. In addition to uh, orderly ministry, in addition to shared ministry, we can also observe the blessings of, of brotherly ministry. Brotherly ministry. You could also say relational ministry. Notice the text. Paul not only wants to relieve Titus, Paul strongly desires Titus' company and fellowship. Paul, I'm, or, or Titus, I'm sending someone to relieve you. And when I do, notice verse 12, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. This was an imperative, a command from Paul. Obviously, you know, Paul was directing Titus to accompany, accompany him at, to Nicopolis. Was, was this another missions trip, Paul? Or perhaps was this a time of rest and recuperation? Perhaps a sabbatical? One can only guess. However, my curiosity led me on a, on a fun research. And there were actually uh, seven, or several uh, major cities called Nicopolis, nine, I believe. And uh, Crete, you can see Nicopolis in reference to Crete there. Uh, it's no longer called Nicopolis. I believe the modern name is, is Epirus. And Paul was likely referring to this place here. This was a major Roman capital and province, Epirus Vetus located in the western part of Greece. And if, if, if I could zoom in right there, there's Nicopolis. And this is an artist's rendition of what Nicopolis might have looked like in the first century during Paul's day. Notice the city's border, the border walls, some of which are still there. In the first century, this was a rapidly growing city founded by Caesar Augustus already well established in Paul's day. And get this, Nicopolis was a beautiful coastal city with ports, warm water, and good winter weather. Nicopolis held the Actian Games, sort of like the Olympics. It housed the gymnasium, a commercial fishing center, a theater where all the philo uh, philosophers hung out, and even public baths. Nic Nicopolis was also known for its uh, aqueduct that brought in fresh water to the, to the city. Rome was known for that. Paul, was this a sabbatical? Perhaps. Was this a missionary trip? Well, Nicopolis experienced some Christian influence in their history and became home of Two, five Christian basilicas. Mission strip, perhaps. Perhaps both is my guess. From the text of, uh, of Titus, these last few sentences, it became apparent, apparent that Paul not only wanted to relieve Titus, he wanted to refresh him. Paul also desired that for himself to be refreshed and to be comforted. And this, is, this becomes only apparent when we look at several key passages, other passages, that better illuminate this, uh, this passage here in Titus. For example, Paul described Titus as a brother in, in 1 Corinthians 2.13. In 1 Corinthians 8.23, Paul said this, quote, my partner and fellow worker, also my true child in the faith. Titus 1.4. Moreover, uh, 
having Titus, and specifically Titus, meet him in Nicopolis. This was very strategic for Paul. And how do we know this? Because Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, 6 through 7, said, But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort which he was comforted in you, that's the church, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, and so that I rejoiced even more. Titus had the gift of refreshing and comforting people in their time of need. He was spiritually useful to Paul. And if we were to zoom out uh, just for a second and take a bird's eye view, this, this was probably in AD 63 and 66 when Paul wrote this letter. So that would put winter in that time frame, right? So this would place Paul near his last voyage to Rome near his final years of life. Paul himself was in need of refreshing for what was lying ahead, ahead of him. He was in need of spiritual recuperation and a spiritual reboot. My goodness, do we know people like Titus? I pray that you do. You know, when they're, when they're around you, when you hang out with them, you just leave refreshed, spiritually revitalized and recharged. Those kinds of people are just so important to the body and to have around in ministry, in life, in everything. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians 7 and 13, for this reason we have been comforted and besides our comfort, we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. Paul took note of Titus's giftings. Do we see what's happening here? Do we see the design of God in motion where the blessings of relational ministry and brotherly ministry is at work? It's the design of God. And did you notice who's doing the comforting ultimately? It's God. But God comforted us by the coming of Titus. God comforts his people. And he does it by using you. He does it by using us. Are we a blessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we a refresher? I hope so. What else do we see? We see the blessings of a resourceful ministry. The blessings of a resourceful ministry. If you're not familiar with the, the, the conversion of Paul or the calling of Paul, take some time to read that. It's an incredible story. While he was on his missionary journeys and even in, while imprisoned, uh, he understood what it meant to have much and lack much, didn't he? And he knew this was the plan. This was God's plans for, for his life. And that, this is why I love Pastor Andy's uh, saying. I'm not sure where he learned it from. It's a catchy phrase. And I'm not ashamed to say I, I'm, I have adopted this saying. Uh, uh, in fact, this was the saying that brought my wife and I here to Sugarland. We made the move to Sugarland. But it, it's this idea that where God guides, God provides. Amen? Um, this was a very terrible time in our marriage. And when we heard that sermon, very terrible time in our business. Fabi had a, a, a very flourishing business at first, and then it just crumbled. Um, so you can imagine how bad it was on our marriage, and even bad in our church at the time. But then after we heard this sermon, man, we stepped out in faith. Because where God guides... He provides. Amen. Uh, and don't we see this phenomenon all throughout the Bible? From Genesis to Revelation, we see this. Where, where God is actively guiding his children. And at the same time, he is actively providing for them at their every turn. This is his primary characteristic. Jehovah Jireh? Providing. That's his default. 
He provides. It's in his nature to provide. In Matthew 5, verse 45, I'm reminded what Christ said, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the righteous. It's God's default to provide. He even pro provides for the unbelievers. God's provision is also true in our lives, right? In the life of the church, is it not? We know this from Acts chapter 2, verse 44 through 45. This was, this was around Peter's first sermon, right? Where he brought 3,000 souls to salvation. Talk about church growth. Uh, and what was in Peter's secret sauce, his secret sermon sauce? Sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. In Acts 2, 44 through 40, 45, it says, And all those who believed were together and had all things in common. Look at that. A shared ministry. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them, with all, as anyone who might have need, the blessings of resourceful ministry. Believers are actually liquidating their stuff and supporting the work of ministry to this brand new church. Anyone who had need. Neither Titus uh, or Paul are mentioned here, but Paul fully understand this. He fully understood this concept, rather. He embraced it. Can you hold your place in Titus and turn to Philippians 4 with me? Philippians 4, chapter 10 through 14. It says, Philippians 4, chapter 10 through 14. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have received or revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstances, circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through, through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. This, this resourceful mentality was just the way Paul operated. Now, now let's turn back to Titus 3 in verse 13. Paul instructed Titus of this mentality, diligently help Zenos and the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Titus, don't just help them, diligently help them. Do everything in your power to provide your, the resources that they need so that they lack, what, nothing. Aren't you more efficient and more productive when you have, when you undertake a project and you have all the essentials that you need at your disposal? You become more encouraged. You become more confident. You become more industrious. Workflow is smooth and you're, you're able to work harder. And you're not only successful, but Work is rewarding. Paul knew this. Look at, look at the next verse, Titus 3 and verse 14. Our people must learn also to learn, or our people must also learn to engage in good deeds. Here it is, to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. I officially became the uh, youth pastor here at Sugarland Bible Church in 2015. And I, I really can't remember when there was a time I, I needed anything. Like I desperately needed something from the church, you know, to, to, to do my ministry, the Lord's ministry, in the youth. I don't remember that I, I experienced any lack. Um, my time here as a youth pastor has been very productive. Uh, not only that, the, the leadership here has gone above and beyond uh, to train me, to equip me 
for ministry. And for that, I'm truly grateful. My family is grateful. Now, granted, I'm not a traveling missionary like Paul uh, or, T- or Titus or Tychicus, but, um, but since, since you guys have been attending SLBC, have you inquired about the, the missions committee lately? When I was on the elder board, I, I would just continue to hear wonderful stories of how our missionaries uh, we support uh, were just pleased and how our committee would often go be up, above and beyond and look for ways to better support them, our missionaries, whether it be financially, doctrinally. That's right. Uh, like Paul, we desire our missionary leaders to be on the same page as SLBC, doctrinally. We will not support any missionary who has a Lone Ranger type missionary mentality. And there's a purpose in that. Moreover, SLBC will go above and beyond for those who would desire membership here to share and contribute their gifts and talents in building up the body, this local body. Did you know our senior pastor is a president for a seminary? Chafer Theological Seminary. He is a president. And for members of SLBC, uh, they have currently access to online seminary levels at Chafer Theological Seminary. The only thing members are responsible for are their textbooks, and a $30 class registration fee. That's it. We not only desire for you to get in the game and serve, but we want you to serve well. There's much blessing to a resourceful ministry. This comes from a team mentality. That was Paul's perspective. What can we do this week? What can we do this year to to make ministry here at SOBC more productive, more effective? Is it your contribution of your time, your energy, perhaps your uh, resources and financial giving? We could sure use it, and we would definitely appreciate it. I am reminded of what Paul said to the Church of Rome there in, in Romans 12, 6, 13. He says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us, is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy, Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, preserving in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. How awesome when all these elements of ministry come together the blessings of ministry, of a resourceful ministry. How the design of God moves forward in action. Amen? What, do we, what else do we see? We see the blessings of a doctrinal ministry. Doctrinal ministry. Real quickly, Titus 3.14. Paul hands out various direct, directives to the ministry leaders. And notice verse 14, excuse me. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. Let's focus on that first part. Our people must learn to to engage in good deeds. If we back up in Titus, this is Paul's entire focus. The teaching of sound doctrine so that it will promote godly living. This was Paul's recipe. Correct orthopraxy, Excuse me, correct orthodoxy promotes correct orthopraxy. Paul knew this very well. You cannot live out what you don't know. You just can't do it. It goes hand in hand. 
And please notice, he said, our people, he didn't say our people must be told to engage in good deeds. He said they must learn. And how do you learn to do good deeds? You show them. You show them. This was Paul's emphasis going back to chapter one of Titus, elders and overseers, right? Be, being a men of a, above reproach, exemplary lives. Paul sums up his reasoning here in Titus 2, 7, 10. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame. There's the reason. Having nothing bad to say about us. Our testimony is on the line. But showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. And the gospel is on the line, according to Paul. I found this very incredible. This verse here is at the center, is at the heart of Paul's letter to Titus. Literally, it's literally in the center of this letter. Paul said, as believers, as leaders, we should live lives worthy of the gospel. That's why I've entitled this whole series, Worthy of the Gospel. It's not enough to just talk the talk anymore, especially in our, in our climate, our culture. We have to talk the talk and walk the walk. Let's not be half-hearted believers. Let's be sold out believers like Paul. Let's be sold out so when unbelievers witness our lives, they say, that guy's different. He's different. Not the kind of believers that talk a big game. Amen? Where they say, ah, this Christianity is a joke. It's a joke. It's just another religion. It's not for me. I don't, I don't need Jesus. I don't need the gospel. Let's not do that. Yeah? Let's live lives worthy of the gospel. Live lives that put a smile on God's face. Where when that day comes, we will hear the words, well done, amen, thy good and faithful servant. So Paul closed this letter to his brother in Christ. Notice Titus 3.15. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. This was typical of Paul to give a benediction like this, always to give voice to his other colleagues. All who are with me greet you. This was the heart of Paul also, to express love and warm affections to his, to his brethren. And he ends with grace be with you all. This is further evidence that although this letter seems to appear specifically written to Titus, the rich content in this letter would eventually be shared to become public. Grace be with you all. And it was a benefit for the churches. Well, this has been a, an incredible journey through Titus for me. I hope for you. I hope that you've gained a lot from this study, um, gained a lot of tools for your spiritual tool belt, and also that your relationship with God has become more close, and even with his word. Uh, we don't like to leave our services without sharing the gospel. We learned this morning that the gospel is worth living for, amen? And equally important, it's worth sharing. If you're not sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ, our message to you is to listen and to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the gospel? Good news. What is it good for? Jesus Christ stepped into our world to die, to suffer pain and death on a cross in our place. He did it for us. Our sin put him there and he faced the wrath of his father, which was supposed to be for us. We deserve the wrath. 
But because the, the, the Father, God the Father, loved us so much, He sent His Son. He sacrificed His Son. He was buried, and on the third day, He arose. That's the gospel. He ascended into heaven and proving He was the Son of God. Amen? Now, how do we, how do we engage? How do we, how do we engage this offer of salvation? Because it is open to all. One word is believe. Believe. That's it. Where is it? Where is it? Believe. Believe in Jesus Christ. Period. Nothing else can save you. Not another religion. Not a self-help book. Uh, not even cleaning up your lives and being a better you. Nothing. Nothing. Only believing in Jesus Christ will save you. And so our exhortation this morning is to believe on Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation. And that way, when we become born again, we can live lives like Paul, worthy of the gospel. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. I pray that you bless the remainder of our fellowship. Bless the food to our bodies. Thank you so much for your provision. And I pray that we can go forth um, during our weeks and our days. I pray that uh, you are with us and that we live a life worthy of the gospel. We love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, amen.